to um, the world student. Welcome to this panel. Thank you for coming to the summit. We're all very excited to have you here. Um, look at how many VIP fans you have in this crowd. We rolled deep. You know? I know. Look at this. This is incredible. VIP. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my name is Susie Han. I'm an associate at GSV. I work with Michael Mo uh, over in Woodside, and I'm your moderator for today. I have an amazing panel of um, very impressive people who, um, and uh, all discussing the topic of the world student. So the phenomenon that of um, digital disruption, um, globalization, all together to create this new student that will be prepared for an exponential future that's much different than the one we live in today. So I'm just going to have the, the panelists briefly introduce themselves, starting with you, James. All right. Uh, so I'm James, the chief of staff of VIP Kid. We are an online English language learning company. We connect uh, currently about 300,000, oh, thank you, uh, 300,000 uh, Chinese students with North American teachers, uh, 50 to 60,000 at this point. Uh, we use a custom-built uh, scope and sequence curriculum based on uh, US standards, uh, really delivering the American education experience. Hi everyone, my name is Li Jing. I'm the global head of the Enrollment Marketing Communications at Widow School of Studios. Our founder was actually speaking at uh, Seaport Beach later at uh, 3 30. At 3 30. So we are a global school network of premium uh, private schools uh, around the world. We're opening up two major campuses in Shenzhen and DC in 2019. Uh, we have uh, strong features including uh, personalization, uh, global perspective, local rules, and our campus is designed by Renzo Piano. So hope to see, see you uh, in two cities around the world. So my name is Joel Hellemark. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Sana Labs. At Sana, we uh, provide a machine learning platform for education companies. Uh, the core of the platform is to personalize educational content. So we partner with some of the world's largest ad tech companies and, and publishers to bring personalization to their products. And I am Luke the founder of student.com, which is an online marketplace for student housing. We've got uh, about 1.2 million beds in 30 countries. Uh, we started the business in China, um, which is still our largest source country, um, but we help mostly international students around the world, uh, going to countries like the US, uh, UK, Australia, and so on. Uh, our team is uh, heavily Asia-based, uh, but we also have teams in the US, UK, and Australia. So just to, just to start the panel and preface, you know, what is a world student? I think, um, you know, Lee, Chris is doing, a, a, has a phenomenal company called Whittle Schools. Chris is actually in the crowd right there too. Um, but, you know, with the goal to, to create the modern school and put it in, in, in over 30 cities around the world. So um, starting with you, um, what really defines the modern student? And, uh, and what, what do these students really look for today that students um, in previous times never really considered? In our typical student profile, we, actually, our, we have actually about 15 educators working in New York headquarters and also big back in China. They are comparing the kind of uh, what is the typical student profile in the United States and also in China. Very interestingly, they are pretty much aligned. So we actually summarize it in, in three words, which is uh, the world of self, the world of humanities, and also uh, the world of uh, knowledge. So I think that, you know, in the probably during the past, uh, um, I would say, 10 decades, uh, the schools tend to focus on knowledge. And now, actually, I think it's a good time to try to refocus on who we are as students, as an individual, and also how to connect the students' world with outside world. So I think it's a pretty good summary. The other thing is, like, I really like how we pitch um, what our students uh, aspire to be. One thing that really sets the world students Apart from the old world, I think there are two words. It's choice and voice. Um, I think a lot of schools try to focus on making sure that the students can speak out their mind, but the voice cannot exist without the choice. In the first school that, that I worked in China, which is one of the finest schools, uh, one of the finest public schools in China, we offer about 300 optional courses for students ranging from robotics, from coding, from cooking, from uh, poetry clubs. So in order for students to really be able to speak out who they want to be, we need to have a choice. So I think in order to support our students to become more students, choice and voice go hand in hand. Okay. 
So, so Joel, with your company, you, you, you basically created a personalized learning platform. So how does that and other technologies, how does that tie into um, providing new models to better educate students? Yeah, of course. So um, I think yeah, new students now, to a very large degree, are expecting much more intelligent user experiences. So pretty much wherever they go now, they get personalized music recommendations, video recommendations, and much more intelligent user experiences, which adapt to their preferences and, and their needs. Um, and I think very much students are, are starting to expect this from their learning products as, as well. Um, that they're expecting much more personalized learning products and in, in every single way, um, not just recommending the next piece of content, but that uh, dynamically um, adjust your preferences. When do you want to learn? How long should each session be, et cetera? Um, and I think also, um, so one aspect is just personalizing educational content. The other aspect is using all of the data that's, that's being generated um, and present that to stakeholders. So not only sort of the educational products get more personalized, but also the classroom experience. So how can we feed this data in, in, an easy, um, easy, uh, easy, um, in a way that's easy to understand to other stakeholders like, like teachers? And how can we feed that data to content writers so they can produce better content? So I think just creating sort of a much more intelligent ecosystem um, um, and really leveraging all of the data that's, that's being generated is, is sort of where we see, see the, the ecosystem going. And Luke, so there's been a huge surge in international education, especially people studying abroad. Why are people more interested now more so than ever in going abroad to supplement their education? I mean, I think there's, people have always studied abroad, but the difference is that 20 years ago, either you studied abroad because you had a scholarship or you had very rich parents. And now, um, with the rising middle class, especially in Asia, um, a lot of people can afford it. Um, and so therefore, we're paying attention to the numbers. Um, and I think like, that's really, really great, because suddenly you've got like, what was a million international students, now six million students kind of growing to eight to 10. And I'm just speaking about university. You know, when you, when you add in high school and, and kind of other, other learning, you know, the, the numbers are even bigger. So that's, I think that's why like, people have always liked studying abroad. It's also like, you know, with the world becoming more flat, so to speak, uh, it's, more people are aware of it. But I think like, you know, the, the other thing which is great is that uh, whereas you used to just do a three or four year degree and that was it and it was just kind of cookie cutter approach, now people are able to tailor and, and kind of design like, you know, pre-sessionals and kind of summer programs and semesters abroad and also universities and, and, and schools are, you know, building campuses in China um, or in Malaysia or in India or wherever. So all of these factors together is, is creating what is, you know, a, you know, a kind of uh, build it yourself, kind of like, uh, you know, whether, whether you start with a little bit of a digital uh, online learning and then you, uh, you go from campus to campus. So I think that all those factors together is what, what's creating the opportunity for people to study abroad. So in general, w would you say that, you know, this global perspective, does that help students in the long run with their careers and with the rest of their lives? And um, you know, if, if you can pinpoint to one specific aspect about the global curriculum, um, what is it that makes these students stand out more? I think you know, the more that you study, um, the more open your perspective is. Um, now I've seen it myself. I, I've studied in five or six countries, and uh, every time it was like a challenge again. Uh, and I think like you know, again back to like it used to be. You know, you you, you start at eighteen and you finish at twenty one. Now people are kind of in and out of university or some kind of like learn, learning program for 10, 20 years, um, even 25 years. Um, and so I think that's what um, yeah, gives you a totally different perspective. I think like, the other thing is like maybe at the beginning people study abroad because it's out of necessity, as in you come from a country that doesn't have many top rated universities, so the competition for those top rated universities is so high that it's easier to study abroad if you can afford it. Uh, but more and more, you know, I mean, like, I, we, we keep joking. We keep joking that because we started the business in China that we were the company that was trying to break out of China. But actually, like, from our business model, since we we're essentially an exporter of students outside of China, already now with, with people are thinking of studying in China. So you have Americans coming to, to China rather than Chinese uh, coming to the U.S. Um, so I think, like, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's really just the beginning of, the, of this kind of global movement of students. So, so going off of that, what, what, do, what do students look for today that you didn't when you were back in school? So I'll start with you, James. So, oh, geez. 
make me feel old. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. There's two, two big things. Uh, one is a sort of um, more new age sort of global view. I, I think when, when I was younger, uh, it wasn't such a, a huge deal. We didn't really realize what the, the value of a global perspective really was. Um, at least I didn't. I went to like a performing arts kind of high school or something like that. And uh, you know, more and more, even even from China, we see a lot of kids who have a hunger for you know a global view of education. Uh, hence, they're in China, but they want to see what like North Americans see. They, we do things like virtual field trips. Um, so that, that's one. I think the the second um, is really this DIY mentality. So uh, I remember when I was going back to going to school, a lot of my a lot of my education was based on uh, memorization or reading, writing, uh, very basic things. Um, but now I see a sort of explosion or proliferation of uh, DIY project-based learning, um, as well as sort of like following like interest-driven or uh, project-based type work. What about you, Lee? Yeah. Uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter, and uh, she actually attended seven oh. schools in uh, in three cities. So I think that uh, I think the major interesting for the younger generation, including my daughter, is like they came to know about uh, things with a larger number, larger scale, and also at a relatively early age. Sometime uh, my daughter and I chatted. She said that, Mom, when did you go to United States for the first time? I said, maybe 25 years old. And she said, Mom, then I beat you on this. I went to the United States uh, at the age of three and spent two years there. So I think even for young kids like this, you start to observe this like a global exposure and the people that she is uh, you know, interacting with. This actually has a huge uh, impact. Second thing I would say is like, it's probably more complex. You know, it's, it's more complex. You know, it's like, that's the reason why I feel like in our curriculum, in schools around the world, so we emphasize uh, interdisciplinary learning. I feel like the workforce now is becoming more and more diverse and also more dispersed dispersed, so meaning that the people, I think the younger generation in 20 years later when my daughter entered into the workforce, the thing that uh, that is going to exist 20 years is probably something that we don't, would envision exists now. Just like I think Michael Moore actually did a wonderful presentation two days ago saying about 25% of the jobs, like also the biggest the companies uh, in the world right now do not exist eight years ago. This, this is something that we probably like 20 years ago we wouldn't never imagine what happened. What about you, Joel? No, so I think um, all of those are very good points. Um, something that, that we've seen sort of in the, in the Nordics and, and, and in Finland is the power of project-based learning as well as sort of uh, interdisciplinary efforts. So in Finland, the uh, curriculum is, is more and more moving towards sort of interdisciplinary programs where you combine the maths with the economics with the social sciences. In, in all kinds of different projects. So some of those initiatives is Model European Parliament, where essentially you meet people from, from all, across, uh, all across Europe and, and you discuss the issues and, and you present proposals for, uh, for new motions that, 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 that could go through, which are, which are later sent to the European Parliament. And, and in those proposals, you have to do the economics. You have to um, uh, put together uh, projects which make economical sense. Um, and also you have to think of, of all of the social aspects to the problem. Um, and then there's also a lot of sort of interesting technical challenges, uh, for example, in energy policies, which, which you have to solve. Um, and, I, and I really think that's sort of the, the future of, of, uh, of, of the K-12 educational system, where you move more towards sort of um, full-scale projects where you have to apply the knowledge uh, uh, that you've learned uh, from, from a broad set of fields and where you also have to collaborate with people who are maybe domain experts in, in one of them um, or are from, from other countries. So I think uh, Finland is, is really uh, moving the needle there. I agree on the Finland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, it's true, like Finland is really like, uh, they've also pretty much removed all standardized testing. Like, there's probably not a standardized test from the age of, uh, of five to, to getting into university. I think there's one test, you know, which is a huge departure from, you know, unfortunately what, for example, I mean, you know, we've all, anyone who's lived in China has seen like the pressure that the Gaokao uh, puts on, on the education system. And it's why like so many parents in China want to go into non-traditional schools 
and therefore they're set from the, from the very beginning they're setting themselves up in a totally different educational system, um, and um, and yeah, I mean like that is that is the future is like just flipping flipping the old system into the new system so that we're going after soft skills, you know, collaboration, um, and like probably more than anything is like prepare yourself for the workforce, you know like how do employers and uh, educators work together? It's already worked very well you know, in the past, like investment banking and, and consulting and, and accounting and like a number of industries have worked already very well, but there's like loads of other industries that are, are starting to, to now to kind of essentially create a bridge so that it's not like, okay, three years at university and then now what? Um, instead, you're like already from the age of kind of in elementary and early high school, you're already kind of like building a picture of what you probably want to do in your life. So, um, you know, what, I, what I'm noticing here is that it's actually, it sounds like a, um, you know, the, the common theme would probably be this idea of deeper, th deeper understanding, yeah. right? And, uh, you know, how, do, how does things get applied? So competency-based education. Uh, I think it's been a sort of a movement. You see it trickle down from higher ed yeah. into, into K-12. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it'll be quite interesting to yeah, see exactly. where that, that entire line goes. So, so going going off of that, um, and we're just talking about education models. Which countries around the world have been the most, um, you would say, um, the most dynamic in, in in thinking about how they educate their students? I'll start with you, James. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I don't know. I think I think every country is unique in the way that they look at education. I think it, it's probably not a fair comparison. One's more or less. They just do it differently. Um, from my perspective, I've seen a lot of changes in, in U.S. education, though it tends to be a little bit slower. Um, China has been moving uh, pretty quickly. I think they, they've recently um, published a sort of policy on uh, sort of the way they approach education and the way that they incentivize sort of like test prep versus um, uh, competency-based learning, or rather the other way around. So that, that's really my limited purview. I think it's like in terms like uh, which national system actually evolves better. I would say, I will probably not refer to specific countries, but actually I would say the country that always keep an open mind will probably evolve faster. Uh, I, I'm very glad actually you mentioned about Finland, because uh, Finland has consistently been rated as uh, the best performing countries uh, by PISA for quite, because PISA ran every four years for quite several, <laughs> four years for uh, a couple of rounds, and then Shanghai started to participate. And I think, you know, there are articles saying that, well, the Finland kind of uh, fell behind. And I actually think that Finland, starting from 2008, 2010, started to review at the national level how they can evolve their national curriculum. And then the project-based learning is one big, uh, is a very big scene. The other thing is like, uh, uh, I, I, I went to Finland back in 2008, and I think um, at that time, the biggest theme is on counseling. One thing that really set Finnish education quite outstanding from the other countries that started to provide a counseling program uh, in middle school and high school years, and then they are trying to bring it down to even to the uh, primary school students. And uh, it's like they want to uh, really c to conduct experimental learning, making sure that the students can get in uh, a wide exposure to what, uh, what a workplace, like firemen, you know, the computer, uh, computer engineers, this kind of jobs really look to be. So I feel like uh, from Finland's case, I really feel like uh, they have a sense of urgency and a need to improve. So I feel like as long as uh, the country system have that need and urgency to improve and keep that open-minded mindset, I think there we will be able to, to see such improvements. Interestingly then, uh, the gentleman on my right also James. mentioned that James mentioned about uh, China. I do feel like, uh, interestingly, China yearly was conceived to be a very traditional country. Uh, the reason why I was brought to Finland is starting from 2003. Uh, actually, the reform is starting from the top. The Chinese government sent uh, the top leading principals all from China to go to study Finland first, and then go to study UK curriculum, and then the people all discussed saying that, look, the A-level curriculum is somehow more aligned with uh, the mindset of the Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, um, education system and also the way how the students will function. So they started to introduce A-level curriculum and then IB. So I feel like in general, the reason why we see 
quite flourishing improvement uh, in uh, educational system and also educational technology in China. I feel like it rests with this uh, open-mindedness that we want to open out to the outside world. Joe, yeah. Yeah, maybe I could further elaborate on why Finland is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> elaborate away, Joel. <laughs> Are you from okay. Finland? I'm not from Finland. <laughs> I live very close to Finland, uh, Sweden. in Sweden. Ah, okay. um, so we're seeing it closely, um, and I think we're also trying to learn a lot from, from what they're doing. Yeah. Another aspect really is sort of the teacher profession in, in yeah. Finland, um, and where they get talent from. So one really interesting concept they've established there is that um, instead of going to the military after high school um, or college, you could actually um, go out and, and, and be a teacher. Um, so most of the top students spend one or two years uh, being teachers there. And then you get, get some of the top students uh, that are super passionate um, and, and you can sort of uh, have them teach mathematics when they just sort of learned it quite recently. So the, I think that, that concept is, is, is quite interesting. It also comes down to the salary. So what we're really looking at in, in Sweden now is what kind of effects could increasing salaries have on the, on the teacher profession. Um, and um, some, some, some uh, we're, we're just uh, about to elect um, a new prime minister. And, and what's interesting there is that um, some of the ideas is to double the teacher salaries from some of the top politicians. Um, and there currently it's a, it's a broad discussion. What kind of effects could that actually have? Mm. Can I weigh in something here? Because you actually from uh, northern uh, Europe. Actually, in my previous. Uh, Career in China, we actually hosted quite some students from Denmark. Yeah. I mean, what really impressed our Chinese students is that every Danish student from that particular school, they can probably speak about three to four languages. And you, Europe is a very great example of that, you know, this diversity and you know, this need to be able to collaborate yeah. at a very young age. So I feel like this is also something that maybe we can learn from Northern Europe. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Luke, you want to weigh in here? More about Finland. <laughs> uh, no, no, no homework in Finland, so. Uh, no, I think like, well, I mean, on, on the interesting thing about uh, Europe, like I think what a lot of, uh, I mean, this has already been happening for several years. Yeah. A lot of European universities realized if they don't move their curriculum into English, they have no chance to compete. So that's like, you know, it's in process. I actually studied at Bocconi in Milan in English. Mm -hmm. I was like one of the first classes, I think, as that this whole trend has been happening. And that was like 15 years ago. So I think, um, yeah, I think like in many senses, like you've got like, because there's a level playing field, you know, the student is like, you know, applying to Michigan and to Manchester and Melbourne at the same time. But like, you know, we, we need some commonality, but uh, so that, uh, although I think like it, it, it would be nice if uh, countries can ke still keep their, their uniqueness mm -hmm. so that, you know, you don't end up with basically the same textbook or the same, the same system you know, anywhere in the world, then you, then you would kind of defeat half the purpose. So, for anyone who's interested, uh, in order to become a citizen of Finland, you need <laughs> seven years in country, and then you can apply for, for citizenship. <laughs> I thought we just really bored you, and you were just on your phone. No, 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 I was very curious, actually. So, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I already lost age. the panelists. <laughs> Never. Um, so, so there, there's a global rise in, in, in entrepreneurship with, uh, I think, 72% of high schoolers want to be an entrepreneur. So, Joel, it says in your bio, you, were, you started building companies when you were like 13 years old. So, what, what really got you interested to begin with and, you know, how has, how has your, you know, your support system really helped you as an entrepreneur and get you where you are today? Um, yeah, of course. So, I mean, I, I, did, I, I, went, uh, I got into programming when I was very young. Um, and sort of, I think it was very much sort of a function of online education becoming available. So some of the first few courses I took was Andrew Ng at Stanford um, publishes artificial intelligence courses. And I could sit there when I was like 13 or 14 and take uh, courses from these top tier universities. Um, and then when I started learning this, there was sort of a broad interest in, in those skill sets. So I started working for some of the larger product design agencies and technology companies in Stockholm, applying those skills on the side of school. So I would sort of take the skills I learned through these online courses from Stanford or other top universities, and then I could apply them directly working for these technology companies um, outside of school. Um, and then when I was sort of 16, I built the first uh, video recommendation technology and built a company out of that. And 
um, the, the teachers at, at the schools I attended were super open to that kind of entrepreneurship. So um, I had to sort of skip class because I was in some investor meeting or whatever it might be. Um, and they were like, yeah, sure, do that and just come and, and do the test. So I think sort of having that openness to, uh, to entrepreneurship and allowing students to uh, pursue their passions is something that could potentially be a bit unique about Sweden. We also have this, so um, if you study economics in, in Sweden um, and you're in the last year of high school, you have to start a company. Like you can't graduate without mm -hmm. starting a company. So that's also another sort of uh, um, uh, testament of the openness to entrepreneurship and how bullish they are in entrepreneurship that um, you see um, sort of most of the, the students in the economics programs collaborating, building a company, coming up with an idea and, and selling products. So, so Lee, um, how, how has Woodall Schools designed their curriculum to, uh, to focus on entrepreneurship um, and, and building a skill set around that? Mm. Uh, one of the very interesting features about us is a core, the concept called Center of Excellence. So in, cause in every city that we are going to be in, that city have a strong feature. Like for example, in DC, this is going to be focusing on international law, international relations, and, ga ga and also governance. And in Shenzhen, which is the Chinese version of Bay Area, Silicon Valley, like Tencent was there, Huawei was there. So I, I, I probably guess like 60% of the um, uh, population there will actually major in technology and also computer science. So there, uh, the expertise that we want to draw from the local community is actually entrepreneurism and also like coding, robotics. So we are a strong believer, actually I've been educated for 20 years, uh, have been working in the best performing schools, but I think this, I would say the saddening fact is that I feel like the world has uh, Develop at such a dramatic role, but to some extent, the, I would say the education system and schools stays where they are. So there is a quite limited exposure to like to for the students to really understand what is going on. What is uh, even the more saddening thing, particularly I think in China, I don't know what is uh, going on in the United States. It's like looking at the teachers. I would say that sometimes I ask myself, is like, because uh, I'm not a typical teacher portfolio by Chinese standards. I don't necessarily graduate from a teacher's college. Uh, but you're thinking that most of the teachers that are teaching our students, they graduate from uh, teacher's college right away. They have no real substantive working experience working in the outside world. So what we try to promote that instead of uh, just having the traditional teachers teaching our students, we want to make sure that the classroom is uh, beyond the borders. We want to send the students to the research labs. So instead of having the typical computer science teachers teaching coding to our students, we want to you know, collaborate with the nearby research institutes and universities so that we can really have the practitioners in the field. So I feel like this is something uh, how we embrace the progressive uh, experiment, experimental learning experience and also try to promote uh, this kind of entrepreneurism for the students. So, so Luke, um, what about you? So uh, how is, how is, how is entrepreneurship and you know, focus on that really play a role in helping you, you know, create and start your own company? Um, I think like if you, I don't know, in my case, like uh, I kind of like, maybe like you always had this kind of like interest and passion and for it, but I think certainly having a, a, the right support network, I think mm -hmm. makes sense. And I think I had the opposite experience to you where like our school was, uh, in our, our school people were like, oh, you know, you're never going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, there was like this kind of like slightly opposite, but maybe I just chose the wrong school. Um, but I agree that like, you know, the more that, uh, the, you know, the, the environment that you're around uh, can help encourage you. But I think also beyond the school, it's just like, you know, what do people need is also role models. And you yes. know, in the end, so, yes. you find your role models. Yes. You know, like, I, you know, I, I found role models just by, you know, reading biographies of people who've done, done interesting <laughs> things. Um, and so I think, you know, I, that's where, of course, like online learning, um, and you know the right, the right infrastructure. You know, basically gives you you know fast access. You know, I mean stuff, even simple stuff like you know the the fifteen minute TED video can like create a spark. You know, and like you know, t let's say 10, 20 years ago, you know if you didn't if you didn't go to the library and check out a book and uh, and read it, you missed that whole topic. So I think like that's where you know the environment today is like radically different to like when we went to. 
to school and university, um, and it's just like so much fun to be to be part of this this new age of of, uh, of, of, of an infrastructure for it for entrepreneurship. I think like living in China is like is, is, is super fun because obviously like China came from like one extreme to the other, and you basically are entrepreneurialism at every every level of society, so that you've got like you know. Um, somebody in a market stall selling vegetables and they're trading stocks at the same time you know and so like it's literally like you know from it could be the founder of Tencent but it could be like you know somebody who's just like earning a few thousand RMB per month they have a side business as well and that's that's super cool so speaking of just a drastically different environment what technologies do you think will um, are poised to transform education the most and on the flip side what do you think is um, overhyped so I'll start with you James oh um, so, James, yeah, you know I, what to not say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so trans, transformation technologies that will, that are probably going to, wait, one more time, one more time. Technologies that, will tran that will, are poised to transform education the most, and on the flip side, what, what, what's overhyped? Got it. Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge believer in this idea of data-driven, um, you know, not decision-making, I think that's a bit overblown, but this idea of like the economic graph everyone sort of has bought into, right? I think that's actually um, uh, somewhere where we can see a lot more innovation. Uh, I think GSV is very big on this. Um, obviously, you hear a lot from uh, folks like Reid Hoffman. Um, but there is uh, increased emphasis in using sort of building up the components of someone's skill set, figuring out where, where they're likely to go and what's likely to fulfill them as a, as a person, right? Um, so in terms of ooh, overblown, um, I, I don't want, I don't want to poo poo any tech. Um, I think ooh, especially so artificial intelligence. I think has um, <laughs> has been doing. <laughs> you already said I'm, it. I'm, I'm trying to make friends. I no promise. Take backs. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think artificial intelligence has uh, shows great potential for for transforming learning um, and ed education uh, going forward, uh, undoubtedly. Um, my, my concern, my fear, is that we put so much faith and promise in artificial intelligence to solve a lot of large-scale learning pro uh, challenges that haven't really been addressed yet um, without this proper understanding of how learning works and how it can work better. Um, so again, I, I, not to poo-poo artificial intelligence, but I think there's been a lot of hype, um, and I'm really excited to see when that actually takes off. What about you, Lee? Uh, I think it's... Uh, the technology that can help to integrate different stakeholders uh, in a school setting, I feel like this is probably going to exert the biggest impact. I mean, uh, in the past, we try to, I would say, for example, uh, for a typical school for the data management system, I'm very glad you mentioned about that, it's like the student have a certain portal, teacher have a, a certain portal, parent had a certain portal, but the information is very separate from each other. So I feel like if there is a way, which I've seen, I, I've already seen some of the uh, data integration platform that is emerging right now. But if there is a way, not only for teachers to be able to access all different kind of information, but also for parents as well. So I think uh, th this modern society is all about uh, platform sharing service, <laughs> you know, uh, like the DD and uh, the Uber is sh all about uh, sharing service, sharing the kind of the value. I think in the school setting, if there is some kind of technology that can help to integrate all the interests, all the information, and to, to serve different stakeholders, that will be a great, uh, can, uh, can provide a lot of value to the school environment. On the thing that has been overemphasized, I would say actually one thing that we should promote more in this digital age, that is the role of human beings. Because uh, I, you know, it's like I have this um, fortune of being a teacher and actually guiding my students when they are in school, when they're in college, and now they're getting the age of like uh, getting married and also giving birth to a child. Uh, it's very fun to look at uh, their growth phase. And it's very interesting when I talk to them, I feel like they said uh, in Chinese, they said, Li Lao Shi, teacher Li, is like, uh, it's very hard for them to remember what has been uh, taught or lectured to them, but what the students usually remember after like 10 years or 15 years out of uh, school is maybe one sentence from the teacher or like how they collaborate or how they even argue with the peer students. So I feel like in this digital age, what we should try to emphasize is actually this human interaction 
because uh, the human interaction, this real experience, uh, how they learn to work with the others is probably going to have a lifelong impact. Yeah. That was Lee Jung's diplomatic way of poo-pooing <laughs> artificial intelligence. <laughs> no, but, uh, but actually sort of how I see it, I, I think sort of AI is probably what, um, uh, what is poised to deliver the most value uh, in, the, in the next few years, but also the most overhyped. So I think it's sort of fundamentally misunderstood in that some market their products as sort of AI teachers or fully replacing the teacher in the ecosystem. And where I rather see it is that um, using AI you could augment all of the players. You can make sense of all of this data that's created mm -hmm. and you can augment the teachers to understand their, their students better. You could augment the content writers to more, more, more effectively write and produce educational content. And you can also create more personalized learning experiences for the, for the students. Um, but I think it makes much more sense if you position it as sort of an augmenting technology in that of course sort of artificial intelligence is going to help us do everything that we do in education now more, more effectively. Uh, but I think to a very small extent it will sort of be, be replacing the, the stakeholders. Um, so, I, so I think, yeah, it's sort of, it's one of the more overhyped and also probably uh, a bit misunderstood in that um, a lot of sort of the players in the space, I think, market it in, in a fundamentally wrong way, like mm -hmm. as an AI teacher, um, where we should much more sort of be discussing what kind of problems are, are, are we solving? Uh, mm -hmm. how, how are we helping students learn more faster and, and stay more engaged while, uh, while doing it? I, I would add, like, um, I think we, we touched on this before, a little bit before the session, like, uh, generally game design and, like, gamification, which is obviously not a new concept at all, but uh, hasn't really been applied yet in, enough to enough extent in, in education. It's, like, it's obviously more fun for somebody who's, um, you know, a young, in, young in their life and career to be playing some kind of game. Um, where there's some kind of reward and there's you know some kind of a, a competitive element, and obviously like uh, typically the level of engagement on a soccer field or in a basketball court is typically higher than in a math lab or in um, in a French class. Um, and so like when you apply stuff which you know is really successful in some learning to, to others, uh, and that's where you know, obviously where where AI can come in you know in such a powerful way um, mm. to give like direct feedback and like you know, like direct learning, um, you know, on something which is essentially. Yeah, maybe to elaborate a bit on that, we actually sort of, uh, I know some of the engineers who've been working on, on the Candy Crush algorithms. And essentially, like, it's, it's actually analogous to education in some ways. Yeah. Because, like, when we analyze historical data, when the students stay the most engaged is when they have roughly 70% probability <laughs> of getting questions correctly. So it's not too hard, but not, uh, 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 but not too easy either. And when I speak with them, it's exactly the same that they've been optimizing with the Candy Crush games. So in real time, they optimize the difficulties of each level to keep you engaged. Just so you're just getting it, but it's not too easy. And then they give you a reward when you when you get it. So like a very similar sort of feedback loop, um, uh, I think would be highly effective uh, for for education. So perhaps we could take those engineers and apply them to something more meaningful than, than Candy Crush. So we, we've talked a lot about kind of new things that's happening that, that's really um, going on. But in a, in a global marketplace, knowledge-based economy, um, you know, where, where you go in life is still kind of mandated by a degree. So in the future, um, as the world becomes smaller, um, how, how valuable do you think a degree is for students around the world to get to where they want to go? Yeah, I mean, I think like maybe yeah, in the past, the actual degree, the piece of paper, the certificate was traditionally felt like the most important thing. And actually, it's probably the least important thing. It's rather the skills that you learn along the way, and um, which is why we're moving away from this kind of memorize and, and repeat kind of testing as well. Um, so I think that you know, where we're going for to is students like looking at, OK, I'm going through this education journey, which could be a number of years. Uh, and I, okay, it's great that I come out with a degree, and of course it's great if it's a highly rated, prestigious university. But more importantly, is like, what do I want to do afterwards, and therefore, what am I solving for? You know, and if, if it's 
if I want to work in, in tech, you know, maybe I'll do, I'll go in this direction. If I want to work in finance, I'll go in that direction. So I think it's really about like, um, you know, customizing courses, like, in, you know, in this kind of DIY menu format, so that you can, you can actually, um, you, you can become, you know, employable, or you know, you have this, you, know, you have the skills that you need to start a business, or whatever it is that you want to do as a student. Joel. Um. So like, what, what, what was the core question? I mean, the, the core question is, how viable do you, think, do you think a degree will be in the future? Um, yes, so I think, um, I think potentially also sort of degrees might evolve over time. So now, like, the, the output, the, the data you get from, from, from these degrees is not that valuable for, for you as an employer. Like, uh, you get the, uh, the, the grades in, in, in each course, uh, but what you would really like is, is much more advanced uh, data about the student, like how do they collaborate with, with their peers, um, um, and, and also maybe more specifically, what's their knowledge in, in all of these different uh, domains, how do they handle stress. Um, so I think potentially over time that, that degree can, uh, can, uh, can capture a lot more data. And, and I think if you look at some of the, the universities that are moving increasingly towards uh, online, that's certainly what you're seeing is that they're collecting immense, uh, immensely, uh, immense amounts of, of data about the students and how they collaborate and how they, they finish tasks. Um, and that type of, uh, of degree, if you eventually could, could get that, that type of data, I think it would be highly interesting to, to employers. Now, if you just look at sort of which universities um, um, did, you go, did you go to and, and what kind of grades, um, um, I don't see that, that data as, as that valuable. So, for example, one of the best machine learning engineers I know in, in, the, in, in the whole world is an um, English 15-year-old which spent all of his time on Udacity and competing on Kaggle, which is sort of an, an, uh, a tool for, for benchmarking your, your algorithms and competing with your algorithms. And he was completely self-taught, but he's probably spent 10, 20x the time on, this, uh, uh, on, on machine learning than anyone else who sort of graduated from, from the top universities. Um, so I think if it's uh, the, 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 if you can get much more sort of that kind of, of data, I think it's highly more, more interesting than, than just sort of the, the university uh, uh, degree. But if universities eventually move towards sort of richer, richer types of, of data, um, then uh, uh, that kind of degrees might also be, be helpful. Yeah. Lee? Uh, the question is like in the future whether we need a degree. I think Ty's question is like what a college education, what kind of value does a college education provide uh, to, to the young generation? Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, I think the dean from Tsinghua University Business School once has, uh, has a concept. It's called, uh, in Chinese, it's called Ren Cai. It's like the university try to uh, create people first and then talents and then skill set second. And also in the Chinese the translation of college, it means big university. But it's not only means that the knowledge that you're going to earn is going to be advanced, but actually this is a set of time for you to set aside in your life so that you can really to meet people, to have the opportunity to have a wide range of experience. So I feel like uh, if down, down on the pathway, if there is something that a counterpart or a supplement or something similar that can actually prepare students to be true to themselves, which brings down to the true value of liberal arts education, <laughs> you know, to learn about philosophy, to, to learn about the truths of uh, the life, I think that's going to be very important. Uh, to first become a true individual, human being, I think that comes first. And second is like, uh, no matter what this uh, college experience will, will evolve into, but making sure that students have a full range of experience. I, I totally agree that uh, maybe a 15 years old self-taught self uh, kind of really talented person can, you know, can, can be a great entrepreneur, but uh, I feel like if the college experience and actually provide him with the real experience of how to interact and to work with the others is the other thing. So I feel like uh, we're probably going to have a new concept of college education in the future. Oh. 
Um, I think it depends on how we define degree. So if we're referring to a diploma, uh, a diploma typically used to be a, like a proxy uh, for what you, what you may or may not know, right? Um, so in that case, uh, I think now it, it's not that it would completely disappear, but it, it serves a very thin slice of what the, this person is. So if, for instance, this diploma says you've gone to this school, um, it, may, it may tell you something about that person um, for better or for worse. Uh, if we're talking about degree in, in terms of like transcript, I think that um, can be radically expanded and probably look much, much different. So, you know, we, we talked a little about competencies and the, and the you know, rising use of uh, digital tools, the digital, uh, digital competencies to sort of define people and trace them throughout their lives. I think all that can essentially get rolled up into what we define today as a degree. Awesome. Well, just to wrap up, we have about three minutes left. Um, we'd love to hear from you your bold prediction for the future of education in the next five years. So I'll start with you, Luke. Uh, for education in the next five years, I would say that um, I would say that we will get to a situation where I mean, I, I always quote the number that in the next ten years, there's going to be a, a ten million. Uh, 10, uh, sorry, 100 million new students uh, going to university in the, next, in the next 10 years. So I think it's like, you know, the only way that's possible is because we're having students from all over the world. I think the bold prediction for the next five years would be that a any student anywhere can access and, and does access um, anything that is available. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's where I'd go. Um, yeah, I mean, not to be repetitive, but I, but I really think sort of leveraging um, leveraging data to augment teachers. So each time a teacher comes into, uh, I mean, it could be either like a VIP kid where you um, represent very detailed to, to, a, to a teacher exactly what the students knows, what's predicted to be their knowledge gaps, but where you really augment uh, uh, the, the teachers and don't tell them sort of to be data scientists, but present that type of information in a really comprehensible way. Um, I think that's going to make an immense difference. Because if you go to most classrooms now, no teachers know exactly what, what each student doesn't know, what they've forgotten, um, what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, it's immensely complex to, to know that for 30 students. So I think augmenting teachers with that type of, of data is, is going to be, uh, make a, a really big difference. Um, and in connection, sort of automating some of the some of, some of the more rudimentary uh, conceptual understanding and giving that to computers um, and allowing students to focus much more on sort of the collaborative aspects and, and project-based learning where they can get the key concepts um, about economics and, and maths through, through uh, online courses and then they can go on and apply that um, in more project-based situations such as the model of the European Parliament. So teacher uh, being augmented uh, with, uh, with more data um, and, and insights and, and students uh, automating some of their workflows to focus more on, on, uh, on project-based learning. Mm -hmm. I think a lot has been said about the technology. I feel like um, policy-wise, I think we have already seen a big tide of nationalism in the political sphere. I was curious, it's like, will that actually bring us in this uh, more and more globalized world? Is that actually going to bring along some similar tide of becoming more nationalistic in curriculum and also in the mindset? I would say that's probably also a question. You have 15 seconds, James. Oh, man. I, have, I was going to do my 5, 10, and 20 year plan. Oh, um, sorry. Seven right, seconds. So, oh, so, <laughs> so, you know, I think I'm done. Just, just. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> I think in the um, next five years, uh, probably not that much will change, actually. Uh, definitely di more data driven um, education. Um, in the next past that, you know, I, I see sort of a, a world where uh, learning becomes very contextualized, where a system knows at what point you need to know what information, and then does that to, to feed um, relevant sort of tidbits in. Because if, if everyone knows, or everyone knows that like learning actually happens in gradients, right? You have to take take in piece repetitively, and that's okay. Um, and at some point, um, at some point, you get that aha moment. So the faster we can accelerate, rather than sort of dumping a lot of information to sort of spread that out at at certain points, um, I think that would be super cool. Ten years, ten years. All right. 
Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.